It's been a decade since we first started working on graphene. What's the new science coming out? Can we develop the technology necessary to take it forward? Where's it all going next? This is what the scientists who attended the Trieste conference in November had to say. It's only one atomic layer of six, so we can expect new physical uh, properties which no material in the world really displays. And this has been found for graphene, and I think this is the reason why also the Opal Prize was given for graphene. The electrons, at the electron inside this material be uh, belongs as a free electron mass. And uh, these have big implications in the conductivity that uh, they can easily move inside this material. So you can observe uh, this phenomenon also uh, at the room temperature region. This is very important for the future uh, applications. It's the material of superlatives. It's the, the got the best thermal conductivity, the strongest material, the thinnest, the lightest, um, the most transparent. And so each one of these has got, sort of opens a field of applications for graphene. There are fundamental challenges now to continuing scaling. I mean, we work, we work very closely with Intel, and those guys are actually really scared for the first time because they're pretty good out to about 2020, but beyond that, it's really anyone's call. 2020 and 2025, the technology as we know it, all our smartphones and all this stuff, is basically to be, uh, will have reached a limit, a physical limit. So the question is, what comes next? The question which really scares companies like Intel and IBM evolved from the fact that actually the cloud that we've become so, so happy to use when you pick up your iPhone <laughs> and you don't think about the fact that actually you're actually sending information up to a cloud of servers and they're doing an enormous amount of computation for you. Um, but in fact, actually it's costing huge amounts of energy. In 2005, almost 1.5% of all of US energy generation went into server farms. And it's been growing at about 30% year on year up to this point. So even if you can continue to scaling, in fact, there are enor enormous energy constraints that will limit our ability to do computation in the future. And we have to be aware of this. Well, IBM have produced um, some of the early transistors. Now, graphene isn't an ideal material for making a transistor, because for a transistor, you normally need a semiconductor. You need an electronic gap. But you can make certain types of devices with graphene and they're, they're actually able to produce reproducibly now actually within chips that you can integrate with standard silicon technology graphene devices and these are very, very fast. As a freestanding object, graphene's got these wonderful properties but as soon as you bend it or put it on a substrate, it ends up losing those properties. I mean, the properties don't completely go away, they just, they just get uh, reduced. I mean, you just have to hold it just right and we haven't figured out how to hold it just right. But if we manage to hold it just right, touch it softly, sounds like a song, but touch it softly such that we're able to change its properties, that is switch it on and off as a device material without adversely affecting those wonderful properties, then I think um, it'll be a new era for microelectronics. We have to find ways how we, as a microscopic being, are able to handle these small entities. And apparently we can't just use our fingers. That's an absolutely hot thing. But on the other side, there's also the, the, the top-down approach, which is advancing with, with all the technological development, which we see where really we use a big block and are able to shape it down into the little form which we would like to have. And I've seen to date in both of these fields and how they are starting to converge, absolutely fantastic. It's not the objects themselves, it's a bit like the space race, it's not necessarily getting into space, it's all the, all the things we learn about how to get somebody into space. With nanomaterials, there's a whole side to the materials, which isn't the materials and their application themselves, it's what we have to do to be able to create them and to look at them, and, and this is a really important part of what we do in the project. Um, this material, for me, is the closest I've come to a Lego, to atomic scale Lego. Um, there's people attacking the problem of graphing because this is such a, we're really interested in what exactly the atoms are doing, what atoms are going where, where this is really materials design at the atomic scale. And there's not been many cases where we've really been able to do this before. Think of it like a sheet of paper. How can you cut it and get a straight edge? How can you fold it? 
Peter Bogilt from Denmark, who's looking at ways of cutting graphene. And they're able to deposit little tiny silver nanoparticles on the surface of graphene. And then as they heat them up, they eat through the graphene like little Pac-Men. That's fantastic stuff. And they seem to give really clean, sharp edges. And that's one way of tackling that problem. If you cut grip, uh, graphene into strips, we call them ribbons, um, you can start to change the electrical properties of the ribbons of the graphene itself. For example, it's normally a, a, a conductor. The electrons will flow. If you cut it thin enough, it starts to become a semiconductor like silicon. But if you change the width of the ribbon just by one row of atoms, then you can change it from being a, a very slightly semiconducting to being massively almost insulating for these very small ribbons. So just little fluctuations on the scale of the atom can really change the properties of the material. The idea is really to tailor our system in such a way, in shape and in, 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 in size, in such a way that we create new electronic properties, maybe also new spin uh, transport properties, such that we are able to develop new types of devices which go beyond that what we have nowadays. From a theoretical point of view, we should be able to predict something. That's the ultimate goal, right? I mean, we want to tell experimentalists what is the ultimate nanomaterial. And in all aspects, you really want to know down to the atomic level what is the structure of the materials, how do the properties relate to the structure. And the only technique known so far where you can really get atomic level uh, information about such materials is high resolution electron microscopy. Oh, it would be absolutely impossible without nanotip. I think nanotip at the beginning, two years ago, created the environment of collaborative uh, approach to, to the new problem. But now it's just the culture, it comes naturally. That's a recent development actually. Up until very recently I was a theoretical chemist rather than computational. So I never published any collaborative papers up until 2010. So nanotp was literally a catalyst. I think sometimes it's luck <laughs> because I had uh, so, so many... I think one thing is that everyone takes it very seriously. In the beginning there was small networks and now you have a network with 220 persons. In one word I would say that is the possibility to support the scientific curiosity in our case of 200 persons. Europe is, is a step ahead, or was a step ahead. The, the race is pretty tight, but there's a, a lot of expertise in Europe in this area. We've got the, we've got the two Nobel Prize winners in Manchester, but they're, they're the tip of a very broad pyramid. The, there's, there's countries which are very actively recruiting. Singapore is a key. Um, they've, they've invested enormous amounts and they've built very high quality labs and they're, they're sucking people from elsewhere. Uh, Korea is investing huge amounts. In the last 12 months, China is exploding in terms of number of publications and patents. Clearly, everybody else is waking up to the importance of these materials. It's um, stuck, struck a chord with material scientists around the world um, that you have an example of a very, you know, ordinary material, graphite, could suddenly be changed into a very exotic material, graphene, by isolating a single flake. And the opportunity now is to, to realise actually that, that there's nothing special about graphite. The graphene is very special. But there's many, many other materials that's like graphite, made of sheets material. Um, and of course what you can do is if you understand the chemistry to break apart graphite into graphene, you can apply those same chemistries to these other materials, such as molydisulfide, molydiselenide, tungsten diselenide, tungsten disulfide. There's over 100 of these potential compound materials. And I guess what excites me as a, as a chemist and material scientist is that amongst the 100 new possible single flake materials that we, will, that we will have, that I would bet that several of them will be as interesting or perhaps even more interesting than graphene. And that's pretty exciting. <laughs>